than this computer. So. That's great. Uh, Thank you good. so much. Sure. All right. Let's see. Uh, I think I'm going to have to do a new. No. Let's try this one. See if this works. Do we have one slide? Yes. And Looks good. Good. All right. Uh, so hopefully this this works without a glitch here on the next time around. Um, thank you very much for asking me to come and present tonight. Um, when I guess when you get to be as old as I am, the credentials get a little long. Uh, and um, uh, uh, so, I, yeah, I've been photographing for uh, quite some time, probably longer than I care to admit, but hopefully not nearly as long as what I'd like to. So um, uh, I am going to talk about uh, composition, landscape, composition, and technique. Terry Butler came to me uh, a while back and asked me if I could do this presentation. And I said, sure. And then started trying to put this presentation together. And I have to say that this is probably one of the toughest presentations that I um, have tried to put together in recent memory. Um, tough because there is so much that goes into composition, and yet it is such a simple concept, really, when it comes down to it. I quote extensively from Edward Weston um, on this presentation, and I love this one. Good composition is merely the strongest way of seeing. It's pretty simple, but within that simplicity lies a whole host of challenges and, um, and pitfalls and all kinds of other stuff. So I'm going to talk about that um, and, and hopefully shed some light on it. And at the end of the day, you come out thinking um, about how you can incorporate some of this stuff into your own work. So um, the, the first thing I'm going to do is I, I'm going to give you an introduction to myself, and then I'm going to talk about rules, and then I'm going to talk about running with the scissors, and then um, I'm going to talk about a section that photographs are more than uh, simply line and shape um, and design, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about um, techniques for establishing a sense of place, because I think that with landscape photography in particular, uh, if you can give or convey a sense of the place, that is really what you're trying to do in a landscape photograph. So I'm just going to run through some of my work here that I've created uh, recently. Um, and I, I've been traveling quite a bit uh, into Mexico. These first few photos are, are from Mexico. Uh, I am headed back down there soon. I'll be down there for almost six months uh, this next trip, so it'll be a nice long time. Um, I'm starting to make some um, relationships and some friends, and I'm kind of excited about the opportunities uh, down there. Uh, but I spent about three months out of the year in Minnesota, um, and then uh, the remainder of my time either in Utah or traveling around that I don't spend down in Mexico. So these photographs are from just kind of all over the North Shore. Um, these are the San Juan Mountains. Um, and this is the Palouse region. So here's another great quote by Edward Weston. And I think that, um, it, you know, <laughs> he really hits the nail on the head. Uh, Edward Weston was a, he was a great writer, a great philosopher about photography, and left us with many great quotes, as well as some uh, wonderful and very compelling images. Um, it's, it, it, the rules of photography are sort of funny. Um, they are uh, there, but you have to talk about them, and then you have to forget them <laughs> or be willing to break them because breaking the rules is where um, you really make the strongest photographs I think uh, but in order to talk about um, 
what is effective and what is effective both as far as a photograph that follows the rule uh the rules versus a photograph that might um break out of those conventions you need to understand sort of what those rules are and the basic rule one of the one of the fundamental rules and sort of overarching rule on composition is the rule of thirds and the rule of thirds states that rather than dividing your frame up in very equal ways such as this you're better off breaking it up into thirds so rather than putting the horizon line straight in the middle uh, or prominent elements in, in lines or elements in the middle you put them on the third so you create a grid that looks something like this and you would place important um, components in the composition uh, on these uh, intersection intersecting points here or you would say put a tree here rather than right smack in the middle you would put your horizon line either one third of the way down or two thirds of the way down depending on what was the more important element either the sky or the foreground rather than smack dab in the middle and you create a more dynamic image doing that um, there's a host of other rules that also go along with composition about merging elements um, and and intersecting lines and and where the lines should come from uh, and quite honestly i don't know all those because i don't follow them i try to break the rules as much as possible and i know that um, in particular when i present to um, camera clubs they will tell me that um, the rule of thirds in particular is just sort of drummed into everyone. Boom, boom, boom. There's a drum beat on the rule of thirds. And I am no exception to that. Much of my work follows very closely the rule of thirds as far as where you place elements in the frame and how you uh, compose those images and how you you uh, you arrange the the various things in the frame so that they fall into this notion of the rule of thirds. Um, however, and I think that that one of the reasons, particularly in a uh, in a club situation, in a camera club situation, has to do with the salons and the competitions and the judging, and that judges reinforce that rule of thirds all the time. Um, this notion of the rule of thirds has even been taken to a, a, a greater concept, a greater uh, a notion of it in that it was a, um, a, a mathematical uh, algorithm which uh, devised this, um, what they called the divine ratio, which divided the frame up in a way like, the, uh, like this and the early, um, uh, artists and painters of the of the uh, Renaissance used this uh, for their composition. Um, so it it has a long history, and uh, it is adhered to uh, as the standard, as the gold standard for photographers uh, and in in camera clubs what i would argue and what i would say is that photography is a different um it's a different medium yes it adheres to those rules those rules fit well with composition but that's not all there is when it comes to photographs photographs are different than um the other arts they're different than paintings they're different than graphic design they operate on a different set of criteria and they work in a different way as far as the way that we respond to them and the way that we relate to them. So um, making a good composition doesn't always fit into those nice, neat little thirds or divine ratio or golden ratio or whatever you want to call it, that it, um, it can have an organic life that is a result of all the things that go into a photograph which has to do with more as i will talk about more later 
than just simply line and shape. Um, there's a number of different elements that um, change that and they change the rules and they change how we perceive things. So it becomes more important. So these are some very formally composed photographs. Here's the last quote that I will give to you by Weston, but I think, again, he nails it right on the head. When the subject matter is forced to fit into pre preconceived patterns, there can be no freshness of vision. Following the rules of composition can only lead to a tedious repetition of pictorial cliches. Um, I got into a discussion with uh, somebody once after I presented to a uh, camera club about um, centering of objects. And um, the person was, uh, the, the, the person's re response to some of my work was, well, obviously you don't photograph for um, judges, uh, uh, salon judges in, in a club competition. And my response is, is that nor should you. You should photograph to make a compelling photograph. And the last thing you should do is try to try to follow some sort of um, preconceived notion of what that photograph should be like and a pattern that is an artificial pattern that's imposed because there are many many different elements that go into a composition of a, of a photograph that affect how we perceive that photograph and that may run very contrary to these uh, patterns that are supposedly well uh, received and if you don't get as good a ratings uh, as the uh, from the judges, well, some of your photographs may not be um, for that purpose. They might be for others, for other purposes. And for myself, um, I don't photograph uh, uh, for salon competitions. I don't belong to any camera clubs. I photograph primarily for myself. And I photograph to um, convey my excitement about the world and about the landscape that I'm in. And um, I, I strive to make the best possible photograph that I can for the situation that I am um, find myself in. Um, and I, I'm not just uh, talking about this for myself. So I went out and one of the things I did is, okay, let's just take a look at some of the work uh, from the various greats in photography. This is a photograph by Ansel Adams. Where's that boulder? in the foreground, smack dab in the middle. Um, here's another one by Adams, which is the Aspen trees. This is about the most centered photograph that you can find, absolutely defies the rule of thirds. Um, I didn't put in here, but there's the moonrise, moonrise over Los Hernandez. If you look at that photograph, you look at where the moon is. Um, it's more center than, than not. It is very close to the center. It's not perfectly centered, but it is very close to center. Clyde Butcher is another photographer that I respect their work tremendous, his work a tremendous amount. Uh, modern uh, view camera uh, photographer, landscape photographer. And you look at this image, this image is very centered. It pulls you right into the middle of this photograph. Uh, the cloud formation, the, the lily pads um, in the center form a, a V line that just brings you right smack into the middle of this photograph and that horizon line is almost center not quite but it's almost center it's slightly off sebastian sebastiano Sagato, another great photographer whose work i admire a tremendous amount um, he has photographed a, a number of different subjects he's uh, i believe argentinian um, or chilean and uh, ha has uh, produced some incredible uh, books and incredible work. And this, look at this photograph. Where is that guy? He is smack dab in the middle. Here's another one of his um, landscape shots. And while the horizon line is not centered, this one has a very centered field and the intersecting lines, look at this. I mean, right here, this line and this line smack dab in the middle. So, um, what I am proposing is that you run with the scissors. You know rules, you um, follow those rules when it's convenient or when it's prudent to follow the rules. And when it's not, 
then you start running with the scissors because in art and photography breaking the rules um it, it does not have the same consequences as breaking the rules does when we might be behind the wheel of a car say or something like that so we can break the rules we can place these things wherever they happen to work uh and in this situation uh with this um house out in the middle of the prairie uh i i definitely broke the rules and i broke the rules in a couple of ways one the horizon line is much lower than a third it's not uh, a, a third it's it's a very uh, small sliver of the land but enough to give you a feel for the expansiveness of that prairie the house is dead center again placed that way um to give you the sense of expanse of this flat flat prairie all the way around it and then an emphasis on the sky giving you a tremendous amount of the sky because this is big sky country um this is a photograph which i took two years ago <clears throat> um down in mexico uh driving along on a back road came across a situation where there was a professional photographer photographing this young woman for quinceara which is her um 15 year uh celebration it's uh when a woman comes of age in uh, latino culture uh they celebrate it on her 15th birthday and um and that celebration can be a very big deal uh and since i've been traveling throughout mexico i have seen numerous celebrations uh involving uh, uh young women and they uh, involve huge parties and fancy dresses and uh, and it's a it's a very large deal so we were driving along saw this i what i loved was again this barrenness of the landscape around her placing her in the middle of that with nothing else she didn't have a bouquet of flowers she was just standing there all by herself and uh using a wide angle lens to sort of accentuate that space and a distance placing her right in the middle to emphasize that space that was around her incidentally this won me a blue ribbon at the minnesota state fair last year so it was well received in the fine art uh, community this is a photograph uh, I did many, many years ago with a four by five view camera, a very formal camera, if there ever was one. But again, the composition on this tends to be uh, breaking the rules, but it works. It's more centered uh, than anything else. This is the headwaters of the Mississippi. So the horizon line is almost center. The bisecting line leads into the middle of the photograph, not on one of the third but it works and it works quite well this this image has been sold numerous times and has been used for a lot of different purposes by the Minnesota DNR as well as others so um it it defies those that rule um this one follows the rules but then also kind of breaks the rules too so the placement of the tree is very much on a one third, two thirds relationship. One third of the way in from the right, two thirds of the way from the left side. The sun is about a third of the way in um, from the left. But the horizon line is is closer to center than thirds, uh, and that's just that's where it needed to be to comprise these elements. As photographers, we are slaves to what is in front of our lens. That's why it's very, very different than uh, painting or um, design, graphic design work, where we can make up anything and put it into whatever shape frame that we want. And we have total control over exactly where those elements are. But in photography, we don't because it, it, is the result of what those elements are rendered like after they um, are gathered, passed through the lens of the camera that we're using, which has to do with the focal length of the lens, the format of the camera that we're using, whether we're shooting with a micro four thirds or a um, standard DSLR or standard mirrorless, which is a, a two by three format, um, 
so it or a medium format that which might be more like a six four five format or six by seven format uh it um will be determined by a number of different factors and we can't always place those elements on these exact grid lines um thank god in a sense i mean sometimes that that frustrates me but on other times it creates opens the door for a wonderful creation that that looks very fresh and very different <clears throat> So the, this is Patrick, Patrick in a tide pool. And um, Patrick ended up pretty close to the middle. Uh, initially, I started composing this image and I placed him much more on the thirds so that he was placed uh, rather than being placed uh, right here, which is close to the center and the bottom. I started out with the starfish over to the right more, but it simply did not work compositionally. It gave too much emphasis on this big black rock that was right here. And so the composition ended up moving to the right more to reduce the emphasis of this. And Patrick ended up more in the middle on the bottom, which is fine. Uh, there's still plenty of room for him, the motion and movement of the starfish is to the left, as you, uh, as it might be, and then it's also sort of framed and capped by all the wonderful texture of the water, which was at a slower composition to, to emphasize the movement of the water, and, and then that black rock um, that sort of served as a cap over it, if you will. Again, the the parts of this that follow the rule of thirds very well is that the sky is about a third of the way in. Patrick's less than a third, but somehow this line right here looks and feels more like sort of a th two thirds, uh, one third, but then you also have this line being one third with this two thirds. So there's a lot of different sort of repetition of line and element in this. Uh, in the Redwoods, uh, in this composition, was uh, made with very little foreground rather than putting the third of the horizon line, which is way down here by the road, rather than putting that up in here, it would have given me a lot of extra road that's not needed and would have been distracting in the photograph. And it also would have made for an image that didn't have quite as tall a feel for the trees. The emphasis that I wanted to place on this composition was how tall those trees were. And the photographers, by including the photographers, it gives a great sense of scale for those trees and making them very small and very close to the bottom of the frame really emphasizes the height on the trees, which is what I was after on the composition of this. Um, this is another one that sort of breaks out of the rule of thirds a little bit more, a lot less foreground, very little uh, uh, water, if you will. Um, the, the, the island is sort of placed about roughly a third of the way in on the left, but then the sky op occupies uh, much more like four fifths of the frame rather than two thirds. This is a street scene, a landscape in a, in a small town, I guess you could call it. Uh, and uh, the placement here with the building dead center worked because it, it sort of draws you up both sides of the streets, emphasizes the, um, the, the building and the shape and the form of the building right there in the, in the foreground dead center. And that's where it worked. Uh, here with this one, uh, I have another image that's similar to this, very different in look, but similar in feel to it, um, where I, what I've created here is the water at a um, exposure, a little longer exposure to create that sense of tumultuousness with the water, darken the, the sky down a lot so that the clouds are rather foreboding 
put the island, the rock, right in the middle with all this going on around it. I'm going to talk a little bit more about technique on the second image that's very similar to this one. And then the image that was on your website, um, smoothing out the water uh, and so that it was not distracting at all. The emphasis is on the rock. This is a pretty formal uh, photograph in the sense that it's one third foreground, two thirds sky, but um, you're very centered on with a placement of uh, the rock um, right right in the middle here that draws you in, but then it sort of does a dog leg and <laughs> takes off to the left, kind of draws you over there, but the clouds bring you back over with uh, a strong line, leading long line to the right. Sort of forming a, an S or a zigzag, a, a Z. I'll skip over these guys. Uh, very strong centered image on this one, but it worked. Strong sky, lots of clouds. The gap in the clouds right behind the rock formation itself adds emphasis to that rock formation. That is uh, very bold right in the middle. Um, I think it works much better than shifting it off to the side because if you shift it off to the side on a third, it de-emphasizes the um, iconic or monumental feel of that um, rock or that hoodoo. It becomes much stronger placed almost dead center. Similar with this, the very strong elements on this are this incredibly flexible young girl and the lighthouse in the background. Smaller elements is that guy way in the background as he sort of forms, there's a very subtle triangle that's going on, a visual triangle that's going on right here where your eye sort of ping pongs. It kind of goes boom, boom, boom here, but all strong center, very, very strong center. And it gives you this uh, swooping effect or really kind of pulling you in that again, it, had that been shifted off to the side, it would have de-emphasized uh, the strength of this, primarily this and this as visual elements. All right, so I'm going to break for a second and see if we have any questions so far. Um, I don't see anything in the chat. Any questions for anyone? Yeah, I'm not getting the chat up on my screen, but okay. So um, go ahead. Thanks. So we've, we've, uh, uh, there's the chat. All right. And I do have a question. It says, uh, are all your images done using a tripod? Um, I would say with landscape work, um, easily 90 to 95 percent are done with a tripod. Uh, those images that sort of um, uh, that I've included here that are sort of transcending landscape in a traditional sense and be, start becoming a little more like um, either travel or even sort of street, uh, those are done handheld. So, for instance, um, uh, our, our, Le, our, our Lida the young woman uh, with the um, quinceanera, that was handheld. Um, the, uh, ironically, the woman with, uh, with, the, um, with a flexible young girl with a leg going up, that was shot from a tripod because I happen to be working with a camera on a tripod. Um, but the, the, uh, the, the, actually the picture, sort of the marquee picture for this talk, which is this guy holding the um, cell phone doing the selfie uh, down in Mexico uh, at a ruins called Car um, Cartona, uh, that was handheld uh, because I was um, traveling around and I was on an archeological site where they don't allow tripods. But most of the photographs that you're seeing are uh, photographed from a tripod. 
uh, and that gives me the ability to uh, change things like on Lake Superior where I worked with water and shutter speeds to create different effects. And I'll talk a little bit more about those in this next section that's coming up here and kind of how and why I did that. Uh, those, the tripod is a ne very necessary piece of equipment in order to achieve those effects. So this next section I'm gonna talk about, uh, photographs that are more than just um, line and uh, shapes and light. And I've, I've alluded to some of that and talked a little bit about some of that already, that, that photographs work differently than just sort of standard uh, graphic design or paintings where uh, the, the artist is putting a pigment onto a frame and can control all aspects. We deal with the um, reality, if you will, of the world. And the reality of the world has all of its imperfections that don't fit nicely, neatly into a rectangular shape at all times, or even a square, or even a panorama. They just don't fit in the same way. And so we have to make compromises. We're constantly compromising uh, on the way that we're arranging the elements that we work with. And we're trying to achieve the best possible compromise that we can to create the effect that we want. So this particular image is again, uh, an image from Mexico, a town called San Miguel de Allende, uh, uh, photographed uh, these, um, they're just, they're these clear plastic um, bubbles on a stick that a vendor, a street vendor had. Uh, and so I shot through the bubbles to capture the cathedral that is in this town, absolutely gorgeous cathedral that's built there and then the um the building on the left with the arches is uh in this town square it's on the town square and this was just a commercial not just a beautiful um 16th century commercial building um that was there but fit well as a framing element for that one side so we're always looking for the optimum to where we can place things that work the best and again, this ended up where I have, there's sort of a one third, two thirds feel in a sense. We've got this dark area here that's roughly a third where this area, which includes the sky, the cathedral and the arches as being sort of two thirds, roughly. There's sort of a third here. It's almost half, but sort of a third of the bubbles and a little bit more that are non-bubbles. Um, and then the cathedral ended up close to the center. That's just the where it had to be. That's in order for me to get the effect through these bubbles to work, this is what I ended up with. Um, here I have uh, a photograph of my daughter with a friend of hers uh, looking over the Milky Way. Um, I think I just got a question. Uh, Dennis asked, how did I shoot that? I'm assuming he's referring to the last image and I just, told you that. So I hope that's right, Dennis. Um, so uh, on this photograph, uh, which is my daughter and her friend looking at the Milky Way, and uh, I arranged the, the, the elements into what I thought would be a, a pleasing composition. And it is a little more centered than not, but it worked because we worked within the confines of what I dealt with there as far as the, the, the landscape, if you will, you're on a ledge rock with limited ability to move around relative to the subject um, and then uh, be able to set up and, and make the photograph. The point with this one is, and, and with a number of these images, is that there is an emotional relationship that we have with photography to the subject, even if it's pure landscape or whether in, it's, in this case, it's a sort of a mixed, what I would call more mixed, not strictly landscape, but sort of a people uh, landscape shot, almost like an environmental portrait, the last one being a street photograph. But when we're dealing with photographs, we are dealing with, with a strong emotional relationship to um, 
a perceived reality of the world. And that's what we filter it through, through our, uh, when we view a photograph, it clicks in our psyche or in our mind, um, certain memories or re reactions that we have to subjects that we see relative to our own experiences in the world. And so that's unique with photography in that sense. Um, painting works in a very different way. Uh, you know, even, even film, film works in a very different way than what a still photograph does. Design work or multimedia work works in a very, very different way visually. So that means that when we go out to photograph, we have to apply a set of rules that are unique to a photograph so that each one becomes um, the best that we can do relative to the materials that we work with to start with. So uh, here uh, I have a barn, the barn's placed fairly close to the center, but it works with the photograph. Um, and it, it, the composition works because it gives that wonderful sweeping element to the right that brings the lines down into uh, the barn and emphasizes sort of that space around the barn. This is the other one that I was referring to as far as the island in the water, churning water around it with dark skies. And this is a, a black and white. The other one was color, but this is a black and white. And, and actually, I, I, if I was to um, rate them, my favorite is this one over the other one. But um, I, I think that, and one of the reasons that I like that is because of the conversion of black and white, because it further divorces it from reality, even though I just talked about how we relate to photographs by trip, tripping and triggering things in our, our mind as far as relationships to the real world, black and white separates that a little bit more, makes it a little bit more abstract, but yet still there is a knee-jerk reaction when we see a photograph that it is, it is the world. It is a, a rendition of the world. So um, we have to believe it. Uh, and <laughs> I'll never forget. I, I, I think it was, um, oh, I'm forgetting, better not to use the quote. Well, the quote was uh, seeing is believing is a blind spot in man's vision. And I'm trying to remember who, um, who said that. It might come to me later, but I think it's a great quote. Um, so black and white allows us to, to give it a little bit more of an, of an abstract that separates it from reality a little bit more and allows us to do some things visually that we can get away with even more than we can in color, I think. Color, we respond so much to the color. And if the color isn't um, exactly right, if, it, if, we, if we fiddle with or we mess with the color too much and we look at it and we go, well, that's not right. And we know that's not right. But in black and white, we can um, change tones a tremendous amount in the photograph. We can make skies jet black and, uh, and, and water varying from uh, very, very dark to white. And there's, you, there's, you're not going to say, well, that's not right. You know, what do you mean that's not right? How do you know that's not right? There is no relationship to reality where if we tried to make the sky uh, uh, that dark in a color photograph, it would render the blue or the clouds in a very different way that we would, in our mind's eye, we may say, well, that's been messed with, um, where a black and white allows us to kind of get away with things. So the way that I created that th this photograph, what I responded to and how I chose to compose it this way was I, I came across this scene of the island. And the water was uh, the, on Lake Superior was wild up on that on this particular day. There was a lot of waves that were pretty good sized waves, and they were coming in from both sides of the island. They were coming in from the right as well as the left, and converging sort of in this middle ground around here in varying parts of where they would sort of crash together and create this white here. Um, 
Ah, let's see, Tom Dent, Buckminster Fuller. Thank you, Tom. Yes, uh, Buckminster Fuller said, uh, seeing is believing is a blind spot in man's vision. Thank you. Um, so I was observing the waves and as they were coming in around this island and the waves were sort of crashing together because they were coming around from both sides of the island and crashing together. And I knew that they would make these interesting swirls in the water provided that I captured them at about two or three seconds uh, exposure. So I wanted to blur them enough so that they created a blur effect, but weren't sharp. So the waves were not sharp, they were blurred. I didn't want to go too long because that would smooth them out too much. So on Lake Superior, and you can kind of apply this to most larger bodies of water, Lake Superior, Lake Michigan, um, the ocean, uh, roughly, uh, I think in terms of sort of three different levels of timed exposures. E either I want to capture it very fast at a very fast shutter speed to freeze the action and movement of the waves, like a big crashing wave with water spraying, I want to shoot that at a very fast shutter speed, as fast as I can to freeze it. Uh, I want to shoot it at something between one and six seconds, which this was, I believe, around three uh, seconds in order to create this effect. I want, which gives it that slightly blurred area. If you think of it in terms of, you know, a lot of times you might be along a, the like Lake Superior where there's a lot of rocks and the water crashes over the rocks and then it's, it, it slides over the rocks and comes across the rock and it forms like a mini waterfall, little mini waterfall. And waterfalls are best photographed at about one to eight seconds, roughly one to eight seconds to give them that silky smooth look for uh, the image. So if you're going to create that silky smooth look, you're in that one to eight, I would say for this effect, you want to be maybe one to six tops, um, two, three, four seconds is usually optimal. It has to do with how much wave action there is. And you have to run some of uh, your own tests to see with the particular focal length of lens that you're using and what's going on with the water as far as how riled up it is to get this a textured look to it. The third area that I think of in terms of timed exposures is do I want to create a really smooth effect to the water? Like you saw on that one, that's the marquee that was on your website, uh, the photograph of the rocks with the, the blue sky sunrise and the clouds, the striped clouds, and then the rocks leading you into the distance where the water was very, very smooth. That was photographed at about 30 seconds. So in order to smooth out the water, so it's nice and smooth, almost fog-like looking or like glass, depending on how uh, the water is, that effect is achieved if you get to about 30 seconds as far as the time of exposure goes. If you want to smear the clouds, the clouds are uh, then being smeared across the sky, you need to get into multiple minutes, like about two to four minutes uh, in order to, to smear the clouds. It will have to do with how fast the clouds are moving. And again, what sort of focal length lens you're using and stuff like that. But generally speaking, roughly two to four minutes. All right. Where'd my mouse go? All right, in this case, uh, I. I was shooting at, at about um, five or six seconds. It creates that churning effect of the water, which I felt really added to uh, the, 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 the sort of wild and woolly aspect of this image. It gave it that sense of, um, of movement uh, and, and foreboding. It's not friendly. It's not a friendly photograph. It, it, you look at this photograph and you start getting cold. So I don't do many of those photos anymore. Um, so here we are. This is Thor's well. 
uh, this is again, it's, it's a formally, photo, formally composed photograph in the sense that the horizon line is one third foregrounds, two thirds, or as well as centered. Uh, but that's, you know, gives it that emphasis of everything kind of going right down in the middle uh, of the photograph. Um, and the, this is photographed along the lines of the waterfall effect for about, I believe the exposure on this is six seconds. Um, so another, this one is, is uh, composed so that the, the, the foreground actually occupies very little of the frame. It's well below a third. Uh, the, the, the horizon line, the, basically the horizon line is right along in here. It jumps up here with a, a, this little rock formation, but it's pretty much considered about here. Uh, and that's because I didn't want too much uh, foreground because it would just be black. And then black can easily overweight the photograph. So the photograph would feel too heavy on the bottom. So reducing that amount of black balances, visually balances the photograph better. Um, this one is, you know, it's got this prominent element about a third of the way in from the right with the light that sort of surrounds it, creates a very strong uh, visual point. Uh, it worked out that the horizon line or the Milky Way on this ended up centered, uh, but it's balanced by um, the hoodoos that are on the right. Uh, this this has a very classic uh, um, compositional feel to it too. Um, there's lots of lines here that sort of break it up roughly, you know, not exactly on the thirds. It worked out that this branch was a little closer to this edge. That's where it had to be. Um, this guy is nicely placed uh, at about that, you know, third, third, third. This guy's dead center. That's where you had to be to put that one there. So that's where you get. Any questions so far? Okay, so we'll talk about um, establishing a sense of place and kind of further talk about how technique can enhance composition. I've done some of that on these previous ones where I talked about the use of the, the um, shutter speed, how, you know, whether I was using a longer exposure or shorter exposure and how that affected the photograph and might have affected um, the composition. Let's see, how did I expose that photo with my daughter and her friend? Um, that is uh, Dennis uh, uh, K sent that to me. Um, that image, Dennis, was done. Uh, it's actually a 40 second exposure. Um, and I was wide open. I had a 14 millimeter on my APS size sensor. So that's going to be the equivalent of about a 21 millimeter lens um, on a full frame. Uh, I set the camera up. I opened up the shutter. Uh, my daughter was holding that little lantern. We had to wrap, as you notice, there was a little blue uh, thing around it, which we wrapped a little hanky around it to kind of dull the light so it didn't overpower it. And then I turned around and ran as far as I could uh, away from the camera to use a spotlight to give her just a little uh, glancing blow to illuminate them. Um, and that's how I did it. it. Took me about 12 tries because initially when I started out, I had a spotlight that was what I liked about it. It was very directional so that I could keep it on just on them. But the initial ones that I tried overpowered them and they just became blown out incredibly. It doesn't take much light at all. And even just trying to hit the trigger as fast as I could, it was a, a handheld spotlight with a trigger. Uh, and I tried to hit it as fast as I could, it would still just blast them. So I, I knew that um, there's the um, inverse square law, which says that light falls off at four times the rate for every doubling of the distance. 
So I knew that if I got further away with the light, that it would reduce, quickly reduce its intensity. So the result was that in pitch black darkness on that ledge rock, which is very uneven, I'm, I wasn't running, but I was going as fast as I could in the opposite direction, counting the seconds out in my head uh, of the exposure so that at literally the very last couple seconds while the camera was still open, I could stop, turn around and give them sort of this glancing blow with that light to just illuminate uh, them. And that also means that that foreground didn't get it because it was a directional light very directional and I kept it high so that there wasn't spill in the foreground so I didn't get this brighter glow in the foreground which you would do if you had a light source that was just set up right there unless you have a very directional light source I would light it very differently now if you like night sky stuff and you like light painting I strongly recommend that you look at a product called loom cube l-u-m-e cube c-u-b-e loom cube uh, and they are incredible uh, little devices, very small um, and well worth the money, but reasonable relative to most um, LED light panels. So uh, Tom, I hope that answered your question, Dennis. Tom then asks, for my landscape images that have sky and foreground, are you using neutral density fill filters to balance the exposures uh, or are you, are you doing that in post-process? Um, I, a little bit of both, Tom. I use um, neutral density, graduated neutral density filters uh, in my work a lot um, to darken uh, the sky, in particular that island with the very dark sky and the tumultuous water around that sort of isolated the island more um, and gave it this sense of the, this, this one island and, and surrounded by all this storminess and that was the effect that i wanted to create with the image and darkening those skies was a very important part of that i use nisi filters uh, the filter system that allows me to slide filters in excuse me i'm filtering very heavily on the skies particularly for black and white work like that one where i want those skies to go very very dark so i'm adding more than one graduated neutral density filter I'll use uh, frequently two, sometimes three, uh, but um, that's rare because usually I, a lot of times, not usually, but a lot of times I might have a square neutral density uh, in there as well, um, which I did with that one in order to get my time to that six seconds or so, uh, or three or four seconds rather, to create the uh, texture with the water there in the foreground. And then, um, the the graduated neutral density is darkening the sky once i get that once i capture it i want to get it as dark as i can and then i go into post process and i and i burn and dodge areas that need to be lightened or darkened i don't do any compositing everything is sort of a single trip of the shutter uh with expect with the exception of the panoramas where i stitch those together but Everything is a single exposure. It's not multiple images that I'm pulling together uh, to create one image. Uh, I'm using a single image, a single trip of the shutter to create it. And so I will go in in post-processing and do burning and dodging, lightening and darkening uh, select areas. And I did add extra darkness to that sky. I wanted to get those those clouds just jet black so that they were very, very dark at the top and really framed it. Um, so I hope that answered uh, your question. So light in landscape is a critical part of what we are capturing that adds uh, to the composition in really dramatic ways. And it can make and break uh, a uh, landscape photograph and how uh, we relate to it and what we see. Our eye tends to go to the brightest area in a photograph. And that tends, for landscape work, it tends to be better if that is further into the image, back in the image, in either the middle or back uh, area of the photograph uh, that we're looking at, so that our eye is pulled in. So here I have a scene. This is down in Mexico. I was in the mountains. I was looking at it. 
the light was very variable. It was kind of changing and evolving all the time. And I shot this. And then a few moments later, the light went to this. A much more effective lighting for this scene. So see how your eye comes into it, into the image more, where here it's brighter on the bottom edge and your eye is sort of pulled down to that lower left where there is really nothing that is that important compositionally for the photograph where here our eye is being pulled into the distance more, pulled into the middle and, and back areas of that photograph. Um, this is a scene that I came across when I was in Newfoundland. Uh, it, compositionally, yeah, I put that house smack dab in the middle. It's about a third of the way up, but it's in the middle and it's in the middle for a reason. I wanted to emphasize its presence with this very bizarre, strange surrounding. And it's sort of like the house out on the prairie in the sense that it's the vastness of the prairie and then this one house sort of you ask a lot of, your mind can't help but ask a lot of questions about that. How the heck did these people live? They were out there totally isolated all by themselves. And you ask a similar question with this. What I ask is why, <laughs> why was this house built here? What a hell of a place for a house. How did they build this thing there? There's like no flat ground at all. They hauled a lot of stuff in there. It was tricky to build this thing on the side of this cliff on this rock. Why would they do that? I don't know, but they did. So compositionally, it, the, the way I arranged it was to put that house right smack in the middle with everything else going on. I wanted to further sort of emphasize the sort of the bizarreness, if you will, of the situation and, and of the, the area. And I chose to do that by using a really long exposure. So I used a 10 stop neutral density filter so that I could go with a couple minute exposure to blur those clouds. I wanted to smear those clouds and give them this sort of surreal effect or look. It also smooth the water way out so that the water is, is completely smooth. There's very little or no texture from any waves on the water. And it again, emphasizes the house more. You're not distracted by the ripples on the water. Your eye goes right to the rock, the texture on the rock and the house. And then the sky is sort of being uh, this extra sort of very strange and different look to it. Um, and this, this one in particular actually worked better in color. The color emphasized this in a way uh, that, that black and white just doesn't. So it stayed color and uh, worked really well. Similar situation with this one. Um, a long exposure, uh, the, the clouds were, were moving at a pretty good rate. I believe I used a six stop neutral density on this and went to uh, um, about a minute or two on the exposure, smooth the water way out. So it's very, very smooth, almost looks like glass. Uh, it also, what happens up on the shore when you shoot the shoreline and you um, extend the exposure, you, it, it sort of works like a polarizer because you can see under the water really well. And the reason that it works in a sense like a polarizer, I didn't use a polarizer on this image, but the effect is that the what by smoothing it the water out and giving it a long exposure, the glare on the water that keeps us from being able to see under the water kind of moves around. And as it moves around, you, the exposure of the information or the content under the water gets through to, in this case, the digital sensor and is recorded on the sensor. So the net effect is, is almost like a polarizer. When you go into these long exposures, you get sort of this uh, effect where you, you get rid of the glare. The clouds, the sweeping clouds uh, sort of accentuate uh, and give the line that, that brings you into the photograph, into the distance of the photograph more. Uh, 
classic composition on the um, Valley of the, I mean, the Monument Valley uh, on this one. Um, it says my internet connection is unstable. I hope I'm still coming through okay and not breaking up too much. You're good. Um, okay, thanks. Um, so this one, the I I this is a classic view. It's from up by the visitor center in the hotel that's there. Probably seen this view a thousand times before, but it still is. It's a beautiful view. It's a gorgeous view of of icons of the west and you it's very hard to go wrong photographing from this view uh, in particular at sunset but notice how i place the elements i have the road the road is i chose to include the road because i felt that i wanted that foreground i wanted i didn't want to frame it from above the road i do have images that are framed from above the road but in this one with the black and white treatment, I used that road, which was a strong light line. And notice where it's placed. It's roughly about a third of the way between the bottom of the frame and the uh, monuments for Monument Valley. So there's sort of this one third, two thirds relationship happening within the foreground. There's also a one third on the um, horizon line, two thirds sky. The sky is very smooth, and that's because this is a six minute exposure. And I wanted to just smooth those clouds out so that they became real silky. I, I didn't want the texture of the clouds to detract from the texture of the rock here to emphasize those monuments more. But I wanted that I knew that the clouds were going to go dark, and also they went darker because I used my graduated neutral densities, which darkened down the upper part even more, so that it created this lighter effect in the middle of the photograph. Your eye is going into that middle more. It goes into here and it goes back into here where in the sky where it's lighter in the sky. So there's sort of two lighter areas that bring the eye in to this image. And that also pulls you into the monuments more. Um, this photograph, this actually, this photograph goes back a ways, but it's, it, in a sense, it's a very classic photograph for me, uh, very formally composed. Um, when I was uh, viewing this area i was uh, this was done for the nature conservancy for some land that they purchased in northwest minnesota it was purchased by um, Wal uh, walter dayton it came up with the money he was a philanthropist part of the dayton family in minnesota that donated the money to purchase this it was the largest prairie purchase that the nature conservancy had done in minnesota to date something like nine thousand acres and so they hired me to go up and photograph the, the land. And, and I was being taken around by one of their uh, guys to sort of view the land and look at it. As soon as I saw this setting, I was like, this is where I have to be for sunset. And I uh, came back there and set up and took this photograph. The clouds weren't there. It was totally blue sky, no clouds. Uh, I walked around and I photographed these trees from a number of different angles and then came back to this. This was shot with a four by five camera on film and came back to this view of it again. The clouds had moved in and I said, oh boy, I got to shoot this again. So I recomposed the photograph and uh, shot it with the clouds, which add this sort of movement and motion from the right towards the left. The windswept aspect of the cloud of the trees the, the branches of the trees up here sort of pull further pull you off in that direction. But yet the space and the smaller trees that are here to the right pull your eye back in here. So you sort of have this effect that your eye wants to go back, but yet the motion and movement is to the upper left. This is another one where the changing elements and the changing sky dramatically affected the, the photograph and the resulting photograph. And this was a scene that's Orizaba, which is the third highest mountain in North America. It's a, a volcano down in Mexico. 
and um, it's what is it? Is it is it either sixteen or eighteen thousand? I forget. Uh, I'm not. It's up there. We're probably standing at around eleven or twelve thousand where we're at here to photograph this. Um, and we were we we saw the the mountain and we were just looking for vantage points. We're out driving back roads and came across this abandoned. Um, it was a monastery. It was an abandoned uh, monastery with a church, and uh, that uh, served as a great foreground for the volcano and uh got out and we were going around photographing the scene and uh we were preparing to leave getting ready to go when these low-lying clouds came in uh and sort of uh from the right and filled that that right side of the scene with uh sort of the fog and clouds and said this is this is a great uh um additional element that adds a sense of um atmosphere and and uh timelessness to it so set up the camera recomposed and, and took the photograph and a couple of minutes later we were totally engulfed in fog and and cloud so here's another one long exposure really makes this photograph so this is uh lake superior with um split rock lighthouse uh, placed very formally on a one-third relationship, one-third sky, two-thirds foreground. The lighthouse is a third of the way in. This was back a few years when the lake was lower, so there was a little ledge rock uh, that was that sort of extended out from where you were standing on the ledge rock that was exposed more than it has been in recent years. It's back there. It's there. It's exposed a little bit, but not quite to the degree that it is here. Uh, combine this with a long exposure um, to smooth the water out so that the water didn't detract. Your eye sort of slides right over. It's pulled in by the rock on the right. It slides across the water to the, um, the subject, which is the lighthouse in the distance on the left. Another one from Lake Superior up in um, uh, the UP on, um, this is uh, Off Sable Beach. There's a number of shipwrecks. Most of them are, uh, these lately, they might be a little bit more exposed. The lakes come back down a little bit, but um, for years it was really high and it covered them up. You, This was from, Oh, 2007 or something like that, 2008, somewhere in that era uh, when it was quite low and exposed a lot of these shipwrecks. So you could play around with them visually. They were great. It's a great place to go if the lake is low because you see all these shipwrecks that are basically just the wreck that has settled and completely decomposed. So all you have are the bolts that would have held the wood to the primary beams and that's all that is left of these things. So they become these wonderful graphic forms. This one leads you just a strong leading line off to the left. Um, this one converted quite nicely to black and white. And uh, it, it, I felt made it again, sort of it, it alluded to the historic aspect of it, but also further divorced it from a realistic look at it so that you become a little bit more, um, it's it's more, well, what is this? What am I looking at here? Uh, sort of thing, which is what I wanted to do. I wanted to challenge the viewer a little bit more. And I think black and white did that with this. And this is about a 30 second exposure to smooth that water out. Here you have like uh, Superior and, and Split Rock again. This is a six minute exposure smearing those clouds they be, become these really strong graphic lines then and that sort of sweeps your eye to the right your eye goes in you want to look wants to look at the lighthouse but then you have these strong horizontal lines that are sort of leading you back to the right but then your eye goes back into the lighthouse again so it sort of brings you around uh, and back into the photograph
um, Monument Valley with the Milky Way. Uh, and in this case, the light pollution sort of helped this photograph out, if you will. This is a, this is a panorama, so it's about six shots that I stitched together for the Milky Way. Uh, and I turn my camera vertical so that I get more sky and then overlap the images about a third and shoot them uh, for the sweep that I want. And in this case, I wanted to make sure that I got uh, the classic, the mittens, uh, as well as all of the Milky Way, which goes over to the right. The, the hotel and we're down below, we're out into the valley a little bit here, away from the vantage point, right up by the hotel or down in. You have to have a guide to go out at night at Monument Valley in order to take a photograph like this, um, which we had. And so we're out in the valley a little bit more. The light shine from that parking lot and visitor center and hotel uh, comes across the landscape and sort of lights up the foreground. So you have these shafts of light, if you will, that come across the foreground here, which sort of break it up, which I knew would happen. When I saw the scene, I saw, okay, there's some light in here, which is going to break that up, but it's black here and it's going to be darker where the monuments are. And so I want to make sure that I get enough of the foreground to go below that light because if I would have put my horizon even with this area which would have been lit now you would have had an effect where the light would have been right on the edge of the foreground and would have drawn you off the frame which is not what I wanted so I wanted to make sure that I included enough dark in the very foreground so that you have this layered effect of dark light dark light and that brings the eye in better rather than having this light area here off on the edge, which would have led the eye off the frame. Um, wouldn't have been a strong uh, composition. Another one from down in Utah. I saw this scene and I, what I really liked, I liked the um, transition of the clouds from the um, sort of ribbed cloud pattern that was to the right, and then the broken cloud pattern to the left of the tree. And then I placed the tree right where that transition was, which makes it look almost like the tree is like a brush that's coming across and disrupting those clouds. Um, it is classically placed in a sense that it is about a third of the way in from the left with two thirds on the right. The horizon line is, it's a little uh, closer to center than a third. That's where it worked out in order to give me the amount of foreground that I wanted, which was below the tree uh, and then um, and, and the enough sky above the tree to sort of isolate the tree against it. Um, this one had to go black and white it worked much better as black and white because it, it emphasized not only the shapes and the patterns that you have here in the sky with this sort of ribbed clouds versus the, the scattered clouds to the left, but also right over here. If you look, you can see, as I pointed out in the black and white, I, I, you can now see it and you now might notice it before you probably didn't, is a little lighter area. That's a bunch of ash. There was a fire. Uh, circle there. There was a, there was a, a, a campfire there, um, and in the color that really jumped out. It became a very obvious thing that was distracting. So in a conversion to the black and white, it made it go away. So the, between those two things, the the emphasis of the clouds, which was a major reason for making this photograph, the the clouds became much more the pattern of the clouds became much more emphasized in the black and white. And then the fact that it took care of that, um, the ash ring from that campfire area was the overwhelming reason why this became a black and white. So 
so this is another uh, one where the light uh, and how I changed the the lightness and darkness of the image. Um, and this is a scene looking at the Abajo Mountains in Utah, and then in the initial photograph of it, including uh, uh, some of the scrub growth in the foreground with this tree uh, uh, on the left side here. And then you notice that what I did in post process was burned this foreground down quite a bit darker. And what that does is it your eye then glances over the foreground and it pulls you into the image more. There's already sort of a near far relationship with this tree here on the left and the mountains in the background. Here, it the foreground becomes more distracting where here you're really drawn into the composition by darkening that foreground down and also darkening the very top of the, the stormy skies. Um, on this one, using time and using the uh, effects of the water flowing, again, this is about a four second exposure. The water is flowing over the rocks. As I mentioned, when the water breaks over these rocks and flows over the rocks, if you use that time of roughly one to six seconds, and this is about four seconds, you get that effect like the waterfall of the water coming over the rocks, which is what I've got right here. The water sort of flowing over the rocks here and here, you sort of see the little traces of it. If I go too long, this, the water flowing disappears. The, the, the lake would become much smoother. We have a little bit of texture out here on the lake, uh, but this flowage here and all this texture would sort of disappear. You might have white here, a little bit of white, but it would blend with the white that would be created by the water because everything would go lighter because you have that brighter area of the, the little white caps that are moving around that, that would expose the water a much lighter tone. So it would all blend. In this case, I wanted sort of to define the edge of this rock around this strong rock here. And I knew that if I left my exposure at about that, as I say, one to six, or in this case, four seconds, that I would create that texture around the rock to emphasize the strength of the, the boldness of that rock in the composition. A photograph off a shovel point. Um, and uh, here I have gone with a, uh, I think it's I'm blanking on this one for getting into uh, a couple minute exposure to kind of smear the clouds just a little bit, uh, create a sweeping effect in the sky. It smooths the water out a lot so that it's not distracting. It makes this tree pop better from the water. So you have this very strong near far compositional element with a tree very close to the camera, a receding line in the distance of the fall colors along the shore, and then the, the clouds sort of sweeping across the sky to add a sense of movement and motion to it. This is another one of Thor's well, and you'll notice that this one looks very different than the color does. The color was very soft. Uh, the colors were very soft and pastel, and that was in part by one of those um, situations that arise that sort of affect things that, in a sense, might be a happy accident. When I was photographing Thor's well, when I was photographing this, even when I was making the color one, I was thinking in terms of black and white because of the subject. It's Thor as well. Strong, um, very uh, uh, foreboding situation that the heaviness of the clouds. I, I used graduated neutral density, but it was a heavy overcast evening when we were there to photograph it. So this was the scene that I had envisioned in my mind that I wanted to photograph when I was there. And it's very, you see that the rocks are very crisp and sharp all through here. The water is blurred. Again, we're looking at about a roughly about a, a four to six second exposure. 
to create that sense of flow with the water. I have uh, used neutral density filters to darken the sky down and then in post additionally darkened it down so it's really dark so that again it's your eye in the composition goes into this area that's more in the middle of the photograph. The color one ended up that way quite honestly because there's a tremendous amount of spray. Every time a wave comes in, you get a lot at the, with the wind blowing, you get a lot of sea, sea spray that comes across and covers up all your lens or your filters. So you're out there and you, you've got about four or five uh, microfiber wipes in your pockets because the, the first one you use, it gets so uh, full of, of the salt spray after about, um, you know, five minutes, you've got to start pulling out the next one and then the next one and then the next one. And the color image was actually shot and I had tried to keep it as clean as possible, but there was kind of a film over the filter, which gave it that soft look, which really uh, added to that photograph, uh, the color uh, aspect of that photograph by softening it. This was the original image that was in my mind as I visualized what I wanted to capture here. This is a closer rendition. Which one's better? As far as I'm concerned, I like them both. They're very strong photographs. Uh, and I, I don't have a favorite between the two. So I, I sort of show both because I think they're both very strong. Um, the final photograph that I'm going to show you tonight is this one, which was uh, at Duluth uh, Canal Park with uh, where that uh, very flexible girl was. Uh, so I was there in the evening and uh, I had set up the camera to photograph strong skies, really nice skies um, and uh, filtering them so they go darker, yes, but add that nice dark uh, sky to it very formally composed as far as one third foreground, two thirds sky, but the, the, the lighthouse is, is centered more or less because that, that's where it had to be, it brings you in. Uh, and then while I was there photographing, there was uh, a couple people that were sh around with these scooters that are all over the place now in Canal Park. And they actually have a little rear light on them a real little rear tail light and as i was photographing and i saw this woman i was like called her over i said hey hey come here come here and and she was like oh okay what do you want you know she she goes i thought you were going to yell at me or something i'm like no 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 can you go down the um causeway here can you go down uh the causeway and just you know do a nice uh uh zigzag as you go down there and she was like it was like perfect she did she just executed it perfectly so that red light is the tail light from one of those scooters that um, brings you into the foreground quite nicely and leads your eye down in so that is a presentation on um, composition um, Thank you, John. That was fabulous. Um, lots to think about. Uh, questions from anyone at this point? Looking at uh, the chat. I don't see additional questions. All right. Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Uh, hope everybody's doing well. And um, I'll see you next time. Hopefully, I'll get down there and see you guys in person again sometime. Wonderful, John. This has been great. Thanks a lot, Steve. Have a good one. Thanks. Bye-bye.